Thank you. Um, first, a short introduction. My name is Martijn van der Kijn. This is my son, Wessel. We have our own little company. Well, there's a few more people involved, but that's, um, that's it. Um, of course, we should be making money, so you might be wondering why are we here? What are we doing here today? The thing is, some of my work, actually quite a lot of it, takes me into national libraries, archives, and taking to work with cultural heritage data. And I always think that it's good to well, just do the job that you have to do, of course, but also try to find some time to see if you can apply useful things that you see to other fields of work, to other areas. Um, and that's what we've done here, which is basically what we're going to, to tell you about in a minute. Um, why archaeology? Well, there, there's an enduring interest for me. Um, I am a historian, I have a history degree. I specialised in applying IT to, in my case, history. We've also been doing a lot of work in archaeology. For example, for 15 years, I was maintaining the archaeological database of one of the cities in the Netherlands, the city of Schaakogenbos, um, until the database was being merged with the database that the council was using. So I've been working with archaeological data sets for years. Um, I've also been involved in castles quite a lot. Next slide, please. Um, because when I was still studying in Utrecht, I did an exam with a professor of medieval studies, who was an expert on castles, called Hans Janssen. He's now really retired. And, and as soon as he heard that I was specializing in applying IT, he said, OK, then I have something nice for you, a nice project. I won't pay you, but you will, you will be happy to do it. Um, and that's the, the register of Dutch castles which we have been developing since the early 1990s. It's now actually recently turned into a proper register and authority file on castles. And even the national institutions in the Netherlands that do work on monuments, if they have to address a castle, if they want to say something about the castle, they now refer to our authority file. To say, well, this is the object we mean. <coughs> so that's, um, yeah, so we need it for free. <laughs> but it's still a very nice and very nice result. And this slide, well, tells you a lot about me. Um, on the left, that's the National Library of the Netherlands. That's where I spend a lot of my time, in person or virtually. Um, if I'm not there, I'm usually at the neighbors, which is the National Archives. Same story. If I'm not there, I am there virtually. But I would like to be on the right side, which is the Council of Tijlingen, close to the place where I come from. Um, and in a way, well, we've managed to combine those, those two fields. Um, one of the things I do a lot is, is advise people, including the National Library and the National Archives in the Netherlands, on, um, on long term storage of data. Because huge data sets are being collected in both cases. Um, they both have um, the task of saving this data for the future. They have to do it, whether they like it or not. And they've approached, um, well, they've just taken a model from the um, Open Archives Initiative. Um, which is a quite a good model, a model that consists of three steps. SIPs, submission information packages, which is the data that you bring to your archive. AIPs, archival information packages, those are the ones that you don't restore for the long term and manage for the long term. And then in the end, if you want to, you probably do, you have DIPs, dissemination information packages, which you then use to well, take data from the archive and publish it in many, many, many different ways. And of course, a DIP could become an SIP for a new system or for a new um, application, but that's what we're dealing with today. Today we're talking about the center needs, the AIP, the archival information packages. But in order to do so, you have to start with the submission information packages. And they see a very wide range of approaches. For example, the National Archives are saying, well, there's a lot of digitization projects. We're not going to make life too difficult for the parties involved. What we want, what you have to deliver to us, is a list, of, it's an inventory of, of the things you've digitized. And that they are, it's a bit like the EAD standard, but it's a very lightweight version of it. Basically, um, identifiers and some information about what's in the archive. Um, then we need the checksum file, so everything that you've digitized and are going to provide to us. Yes, we need the checksum, otherwise uh, we can't store them for you later on. Um, you, can, uh, you have to embed some metadata. You don't want separate metadata files, now you just have to put information in the headers of the files that you're providing to us. So it's actually not that much. It's things like um, the date on which a certain scan was made, for example. Maybe uh, the model of the camera that was being used. 
Um, it can be a headline or a copyright sticky, that's about it. Only about 10, 15 tags that you have to fill. And of course, your dates. You have to provide them, the digital dates. The National Library takes a whole different approach. They say, okay, yes, we, still, we also have an inventory. As in the packing slip, you want to be able to check if you were delivering everything you thought that you would deliver. And we also want checksum files, but only at the top level. We want checksum files for, amongst other things, the MATS files. And in those MATS files that you also have to explain, which is an XML standard, in those MATS files is actually most of the information. In there, you will find all the details about the files that you have been providing, maybe even some descriptive metadata. Um, and we're also using premise, reservation metadata. Which is um, very precise statements about everything that has happened to the digital object. And to begin with, for example, um, the day it was created is in there, the event of creation for the object is in there. But you can imagine that if an object stays in the archival information system for a long time, the list of events will grow. There will be new events, it will be checked, it will be migrated, it may be, well, it really shouldn't be, but it may be updated even. So then there should be more and more events that will, um, that will be added. So a very different approach, far more looking at managing the data for the long term. So yes, they ask for more, then again they can promise that your object will be well, still available in 30 years' time. Or even more. And of course the objects themselves have to be delivered as well. Um, oh yeah, this is still just, just a visualization of the SIP AIP DIP model. We already talked about it, it's fine. Now, those two standards that are using are <coughs> METS and PREMIS. METS is the metadata encoding and transmission standard, which is kind of a shell. And that's what you see here. Um, it has a header, it spells it down, METS document, and that's all fine. It then allows you to add some descriptive metadata, which is good, but it doesn't, doesn't say how you have to do it. It's basically the space for descriptive metadata is <coughs> maybe every standard you have. Which is good, because earlier today we realized that we had been developing lots of different standards over the past years and we do not always agree on which standard is best or well, that says I don't care. As long as you put it in there, I'm fine with it. And there's administrative metadata, a lot of information about the files that you are actually storing. Then there is the file section, which basically lists all those files, very useful. And there's a structural map, and that may be the best thing about Max. It actually allows you not just to preserve a list of files, to tell the world how they should, um, should be, be seen together. For example, in the National Library, if you digitize a newspaper, there will be two structural maps. There will be one structural map that tells you which page was part of which issue, which is very useful because you can visualize your tech again and offer it to people in the right order, very clear. But there's a second structural map, which is even better, that you could use to indicate to people what articles are in this newspaper. And of course, they can be spread all over the newspaper, so very good if you can say, okay, this article starts on page one, so it goes on on page two, on the right top corner, and then finishes on page five, right at the bottom. It's not possible to do that in a very standard Next one. And then there's the premise standard, which again is about, well, basically keeping a record of what you are doing to the object. And that um, has intellectual entities, basically, things like a newspaper. Um, the actual objects that constitute the digital objects that <coughs> make this intellectual entity. Events, things you use with, rights, and agents, parties that actually do the work. Because that's another important part. Um, well, it must be relevant to most of you as well, but in the library we do want to know, for example, which, uh, which company did the actual digitization. There's nice for statistics, yes, but also something goes wrong. If you notice that in the recent uh, submission they've made some errors, we might want to have a look at the ones they provided us with before and see if the same kind of errors are popping in the So it can be very useful to know. Um, and the good thing is that, um, especially the premise, has entirely enclosed, encouraged the whole development of, of authority files. In, in fact, they've gone so far, and this is an illustration of it, if you want to say <coughs> that a file has been normalized, this means that it has been made suitable for actual preservation by kicking out the things you don't need, 
then you do so in premise file by actually referring to this URL that's over there, which tells you I mean normalized, asking that premise standard, and if you don't believe me, you can actually follow the URL and have a look there and see if it's indeed the same normalization as you would want to do. But I've really gone for, um, well, for basically for authority files in the following description. Next one. Um, this is the, I'm going to do something now which is um, dangerous and which I'm hardly ever allowed to do. I'm going to show you some XML, um, because I like it, but also because I think it helps. Um, this is the match file from the beginning. This kind of fits with what you just saw just before when I just used the components. So I've got a header, descriptive metadata, administrative metadata, file section, and structure now. Um, very straightforward descriptive metadata. <coughs> very short. The only thing we see here, because that's what I did, I, I knew those standards from working for the library in the archive. And I started applying them over a well, maybe the past, past year a bit longer. I started applying them to my other field of interest, which is the castles in the Netherlands. So, okay, if I want to have descriptive metadata about the castle, this might just be enough. This is a link to the National Register of Castles. So I don't really need to say anything more. But if I want to, for practical reasons, I could actually include a full description here, including the name of the castle, the location, the type of castle. This might, might make it easier to work with the file, of course. But if you just want to say that you identify the object, then this would probably be enough. Just taking the authority file, point to it, and say this whole preservation package, if you wish, is linked to this object which is part of the authority file, if you want to know more. <coughs> Next one. Um, <coughs> and then we get, and this is not, of course, this is all being generated by software. I'm not doing this by hand, fortunately. Um, but this is um, a typical blob of premise. Where you can actually, the, the, the main thing it's saying here is that we have an, an object that is a representation, in this, in this case a console, and it tells us a few things about it. Identifies it and it says that it's then is happening. And it also at the bottom it tells you there is a rights statement. So you have some information on who is able to use this under what circumstances. Next one. And then we've got premise files. So representation is the whole thing, the whole castle. Now we're going to address individual files, in this case an image, a photograph of the, of the castle in question. Same setup, but slightly different. As you can see here, the checksum for this object is actually part of this premise record. That was a one we one earlier. Um, we, we, we put all the checksums, we made them an integral part of the package that we're storing. In the case of the National Archive, there's a separate file, which is, is fine, but well, there is a slight risk of losing the file. In the case of the, the, the Mets and Paris approach, the checksum is actually in the actual. Um, actual data. Okay, next one. And then another thing, <coughs> also great for people from the library and archive world who like to collect metadata, all kinds of metadata, and you know, also like to, to, well, they, they don't like to lose it. So if you want to, you are allowed to put well, almost the whole metadata history of your object in here. For example, in the, in the National Library, we put in, uh, an export from the catalog records in this blog. So, okay, yeah. We don't know how the future will look. In 30 years' time, it may be interesting for someone to know that this object that has been digitized was described in our catalog as such. And then we can just put it in there. In this case, there isn't a whole lot to say about the castle because I've been pointing to the authority file already, so I'll probably leave it empty for my castle. But I can do it, so I won't have to lose the information. Next one? Yeah. Oh, this is the next one. Thank you. Then there's the actual file section. Uh, finally, we said finally you see the actual file name here. So yes, we are talking about the real document. It is there, and you can actually find a way to it. Um, if you just notice the checksum is here again, that's in this case that's for practical purposes. It's easier when working with the file. If you can either go to the file section and pick up the checksum, or go to the premise section and pick up the checksum. The thing is, the flexibility is important to note. Okay, you can actually, if you want to, if you have a good reason for it, um, you, can, you can store the same information in several places in the document without 
leaving the specifications of the standards. So in this case, we've chosen to do it twice. Um, and then there's the structural map. Um, selection of the force. Say, yeah, thank you. Say in, in this case, um, I find it important to um, to keep track of the information that the photographs have been uh, put in the system, but they were part of a photo album. It might be good to know that, it might be good to keep that information. In this case, I can say it like this. I can say, okay, this was just a group of images, not just one, a group of images. And it also, uh, and then, of course, the numbers all tie in to the blocks we saw before. They all point back to the premise object, they point back to um, the checksums and all other information. So it's, um, it's full of pointers, but those pointers are all generated by the software, so that's good. And they all mean something, which is even better. Um, next one. And of course, the next step, just to see if this actually works. It's great that the National Archives and the Royal Library and they want to um, set up their main um, depots using all kinds of software. But they have large budgets to actually develop the software and work on it and have it, um, have it adapted to their needs. If I were to do it for my console, for my people at the Council Foundation, I can't say, okay, you have money enough to buy this big chunk of software and money out Because that's all their money gone for the next 10 years. I'm not going to do that. So what I did, I took something which is available online, which follows this SIP, AIP, DIP model explicitly, but that's why they've made this, this bit of software. And well, I can only tell you, and I'm, I'm willing to show you that it doesn't fit in the timeline, um, that it works beautifully. It's a standard software which generates those packages for you, including the mass files, including the premise. Only drawback is, well, they like you to have done your core beforehand. And I don't mind, but the core is always the best choice. So I hope they will continue their development and make it a bit more flexible in that respect. But as a test case, it worked. You can actually produce those files just using quite standard software for, for today. So that's a good thing. Now, then, of course, going from castles to archaeology. It's not a huge step. If I want to store for the long term the data about, say, excavation, the memory we have gathered from the story, at least I hope, it will already have the model. It has been tried and tested by libraries and archives. The standards are there, and even the software is there in many cases. So storing your excavation data for the long term, that's all this. I don't have to worry about it, you need it. Um, just to make sure, it's not just possible to store documents like um, text and photographs, you can also store um, uh, bits and bytes, so that the complete, um, I don't know, LiDAR data sets could be in a few months. But there's another thing, that's the, sec the second structural map, is the button. You could also use the structure, the struct map approach to put some of the information about the actual excavation in. And I've been experimenting with some of it. I've shortened the example considerably. But you could actually, and give you more data from the boss, you could actually put features in. Um, make sure that, that, uh, that, that you put information in which finds were found in which context. If you really want to, it can be in there, and then it will be related to the photographs you took, to the drawings you made, to the data you put in, to your um, Excel sheets that might still be in there. So it's um, promising, I would say. <coughs> And that is to, to, uh, to sum it up, if we're looking at the possibility of applying this method for long-term storage of archaeological data sets, the availability of suitable method standards, check the there. And they've been used and tested, the experience in applying those standards, yes, definitely, many different places right now, not just in the Netherlands. Almost every national library in Europe uses maths and premises. A lot of archives do, including your own. Is that how you buy the Well, the Yolanda's Arif, is that is correct? They use it as well, not the only ones. There's lots of places in the archive and library where these standards are bread and butter, used every day. So that's not an easy one to try. The archaeological application profiles, they're not there yet. We're making some, but that's working great. Us. Availability of data dictionaries and authority files, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but that can be worked on. Serialization, 
Well, if you think about serializing it in things like triples or quads, or, um, and for some standards it's easy. Prevalence is quite straightforward. Next is still a bit more difficult, but we're getting there. And finally, visualization. Because these standards have been around for quite a while, there are all kinds of viewers for Nets and Nets Prevalence. So, as far as I'm concerned, I'm certainly going to recommend this to people of the, the Council Foundation in the Netherlands. And I think more people could benefit from it. Thank you.